the maintenance aspect on, on the machines. Um, the 90 extruders, has everybody seen one of these before? One of these uh, lubrication charts? Uh, <coughs> I hope you have. Um, some, some of the bearings uh, take grease, for example, every 40 hours, and then some every four hours. Um, <coughs> a, lot of, a lot of you guys might have automatic greasers. Uh, some of you probably don't, um, but that is, that is probably one of the most important things uh, is to keep track of, of your greasing. Um, if you don't have one of these charts, uh, we can get you the chart. I also know it's, it's a little difficult too because you'll have guards up and even, even if you do have an automatic greaser, you want to pay attention to that because um, a lot of people take for granted that that thing's just working because you can hear it kick on, but you really don't know if grease is coming to all your ports until you, you open them up and check it. Um, and I've seen, I've seen that before where a grease line got pinched by something and it wasn't getting grease up on the pug mill to the uh, labyrinth seal right there at the back of your, your pug and they were, that's, that was the reason why they were having clay leak out the back. So uh, even if you do have an automatic grease machine, most of you probably have PMs that you do and one of those PMs is probably to check all your grease lines. Um, you want to, yeah, <coughs> I think, uh, so that was on the, uh, the extruder. This is, this is the pug sealer. Um, one of the uh, real important things that a lot of people overlook too is, is on this hub for your pulley. Um, that is one that, that there is no remote grease line to, to grease and your automatic greaser will not grease that one. That's the one you actually have to go in there, lock the machine out and grease your hub. That gets overlooked a lot. That's probably the one that gets overlooked the most. Um, Uh, one of the other things that um, that's important is also your uh, your, your thrust bearings um, on your pug mill. It's up here in the front. You want to have your oil level when you're stopped halfway through the sight glass. Uh, also on the extruder, you got your thrust bearing right there in the back of the extruder, just below your uh, vacuum chamber. Uh, that's an, you want to make sure you've got the oil level in there. And uh, we recommend uh, the luber what is it the luber plate? Uh, luber plate number eight. Number eight. Um, <coughs> that's that's what we recommend. Um, I don't know how many of you have checked your magnetic oil filters. It says every 160 hours. Um, I know Marco, you and I did that one day, and I was surprised to see how much we actually were able to clean off of that. And what we ended up doing was we bought an extra magnetic filter uh, so that we could pull it out, put the new clean one in there. And then we could take the other one and spend some time cleaning it because it took us a little while to clean clean it off. Um. Yeah. yeah, I think we'll talk about it a little bit. I think we've got a picture of, uh, of letting pressure back off of those. Uh, oh, the uh, cap? The, the, uh, yeah, the sight glasses. But I think we've got a better picture in there to demonstrate that. So we can talk about that. Okay. You want to move on? Yeah. Um. <coughs> Here's a chart of the different types of, uh, uh, like the different types of grease on, on the uh, lubrication chart. It'll say like use type A, and type A is an extreme pressure. Um, and uh, then you've got B, extreme pressure type gear oil, and it goes through the, the different weights of the oil uh, where it's recommended. And then they, I think the, what may be a little bit unique to look for is where that is labeled it, EP or extreme pressure. Yeah. That's, uh, and so the oil that goes into the gearboxes is going to be in that B category. Mm -hmm. And so depending on kind of what you consider ambient temperature to be, it's typically you're going to have either a, that, a, a 320 or a 460 gear lube in, in the uh, uh, lubrication in the gearbox and then the luber plate number eight and the, and the thrust assemblies. But yet again, this is another one. If you ever have any question about what you're using, we can, we've got the chart should be in the OL and N, but we can supply additional ones, so it's, it's not a problem to do that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> this is talking about your oil change intervals for your uh, sure and your pug for the thrust bearings. Um, the break-in period, if, you, if you've got a new assembly, is to change it after 100 hours, and then every other, <coughs> every 1,000 hours, 
uh, of operation after the break-in period. Um, I don't know that how many of you actually track the hours. I think we normally went like every six months. Isn't that sound about right, Marco? That you used to do it, <coughs> or that we scheduled to do it? Yeah, well, we have a piece so we go by the pieces. Oh, you going by the pieces? Does anybody else have a, a good method how how they track it, or is it kind of set up in your PM system? Dry erase board. Dry erase board. Hey, that works. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. But, but if you're if a one shift operation, that's going to be r roughly a thousand hours. Is going to be roughly six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be roughly six months. If you're running two shifts, then it's going to be half that. So. Um, not not too much trouble to remember. Yeah. Or to record. Yeah, but I like the dry erase board. I like to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, on that on that uh, a diagram pole is pretty colored and everything. Yeah. Uh, we have a relatively new maintenance squad with some young kids that, that really don't know shit about the trick plan. Uh, so is something like that really available that we can get? Oh yeah. Yeah, I've got your email. I can I can shoot you the email with all that stuff on there. With for what? Okay. Yeah, you guys. I mean, the, you know, looking at that oil chart, the ABCD, whatever. I mean, that is in the book. Robert, Robert said that. Mm -hmm. So I'm repeating, and a lot of the things that Robert showed you up there about some of the pictures and the the, the talking points he had are in the book. So if you don't have the book, I mean. You know, AC Steel's got the books. Most people have the books. They're hidden on a shelf. In it. So if you haven't seen them, you know, look for the book because a lot of that good information is right there. Yeah, and it is. There, there is a lot of information in the books, and the drawings are pretty good in the book as well. I mean, you can you can tell how many <coughs> uh, liners you need in your in your extruder by by the picture if if you're not sure. Um, you can even tell how the the liner holder is, goes into the barrel. If you look at that picture and study it close, I mean, you got to you got to look close, but it'll it'll help you out. Uh, that book will help you out more if you if you just look close at it. Uh, so here's here's a picture of the thrust bearing up on the uh, the pug, and then <coughs> here's your one on your extruder. Uh, this is the uh, pressure relief on the magnetic oil filter that Robert was talking about. Um, so you want to check this and have your uh, oil halfway through the sight glass on both of those. And then uh, down here as well, um, if you don't see it in your sight glass, you, you probably, if you relieve the pressure on here, it'll probably come up and you'll see it if it's, if it's where it should be. Um, I've, I've uh, made the mistake of thinking that there was no oil in it and then pushed pushed it and released the pressure and then it came up to right where it was supposed to be so uh, necessary for it to, to be pressurized I think it just creates pressure you know, and, and let's think about what happens so, so when you start operating the machine it, the, the gears it, the, uh, well and actually it's a good thing we'll talk about that in a little bit too but it, you, you pull you pull all out of that when everything starts running well it, it, it just naturally generates some, uh, some pressure in there once you pull the oil out and there's no way to release the air in that cavity mm -hmm. if you don't uh, if you don't have that pressure relief on there or and I think there used to be vent valves on uh, under there but if you don't release that it just won't let oil come back up in the sight glass and I, I was like Lord I love, I love Jeff Coger he told a story. I can't remember it. Anybody know off the top of their head what the extruder gearbox holds? Is it, it, it's on that first chart. Is it 40 gallons? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's up there. Well, I think he managed to put about three gallons of oil in one one night because he had not, uh, it, it, they, he had not let the oil come back up in that sight glass and he kept putting oil in it and couldn't get any oil in it. And uh, and then had to figure out how do you get two gallon uh, two drums oh, of that thing. Yeah. So <laughs> three barrels in there. Anyway, like I said, learning from other people's mistakes. We want to ask George. We have stone air filters. Plug them in. Say he said uh, the stone filters. Yeah, 
like a, like a muffler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which which should work fine. Okay. Uh, okay. It, it, it should work fine. I think we wound up and had had that I issue. If you've got something that'll naturally, it doesn't have to. The answer is, I get your question now. It does not have to be pressurized. Okay. It actually just happens, and that's the way we cor we correct it. If you've got those stones, they ought to naturally let a a atmospheric pressure, and it, it ought to go back to where it's supposed to be. So that's a good question. I got a question on it. That raised thrust bearing. Is it heated onto the shaft, or we can just heat to the slide it off? The uh, the thrust bearing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what What do you mean? Is it Is it heated on the the uh, Oh, the fitment of the bearing actually on the shaft? Uh, yeah. Uh, you got to heat it up, put it on. Yeah, it's not it's not a, a slip fit, is it? It's a what is the that's a uh, yeah. Yeah. Both ways. I thought it was either heated on, and I I could vaguely remember the slips off. I'm not sure. You know what? I don't know the answer to that. I hope we can get an answer answer that. I've, I can't remember if that's a slip fit or not. Well, I've I've watched them assemble one in, in in the shop back at Statesville, and they had to heat the bearing up on that machine that they've got there. They've got I, I don't even know what. The machine is called uh, just a bearing. Heater. It's a bearing heater. A bearing heater in the shop. Yeah. Uh, and uh, after they heated it, they were able to slide it right on. But uh, they, yeah, they pretty much said that if you don't heat it, then it's not going to go on there. <coughs> uh, let's see. <coughs> Here we're looking at. Uh, here's the. Uh, the grease fitting on the hub on the pulley uh, shiv, uh, that's the one. Um, I know on the 75, it recommends that you put grease into it until you can see it come out. Um, I know some people just say they go over there and give it a few shots, but it holds a lot of grease. Um, so you want to make sure that that's not overlooked. And uh, that uh, needs to be greased once every uh, 40 hours. So if you're you know working a 40 hour week. Uh, here's your uh, <coughs> feed roll shaft. Um, Let's see what else we got here. Uh, and your uh, thrust bearing. Um, you want to make sure all that is getting greased because that uh, purges you know all the dirt out of it. Uh, that's that's one thing I think that a lot of people don't really do. You, you can't. Am I correct by saying you can't put m too much grease in those, Robert? So more is better than not enough. Um, and I think that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. And in that lower left hand picture, we had talked about earlier about feed roll swipes and, the, and swiper tips. And that's an easy one to see right there because that's just the lower vacuum chamber without the, what we call the upper vacuum chamber. Uh, it's sitting on top of it in the shop, so it's easy to see. But in the plant, you've got that's just, you got to kind of work to get in there to see it. But those up in front wear pretty much. Good. <coughs> yeah, and that's uh, that's one of those spots easy to overlook. Um, that they will eventually wear all the way through until they break. And at the yeah, out of sight, out of mind. All right, there you go. Um, <coughs> here's a picture of the shaft. Um, I, I believe we've got that in there. If, when you're installing your uh, your augers, you all put grease on there. Everybody does that pretty much. Makes it easier for them to slide back out when you're ready to take them out. Uh, so, some people even put a, a bead of uh, silicone in between the auger segments to help act as a, as like a gasket uh, to keep the dirt from getting in there. Because I mean that's no fun trying to pull augers out. If, if you've done that. And, uh -huh. and that was another idea that came from a customer. Yeah. Somebody was doing that in the field, and, and, uh, but, but actually putting a bead of silicone on and actually letting it set up yeah. overnight. Yeah, letting it set. So, so it's not really glued together, but it's just as, acting like a gasket That's right. more than anything. And then your take-up gland over there on the left. Yeah, on, on your take-up gland, uh, <coughs> the, uh, you, you want to make sure that's pretty much even all the way across. You don't want to have it cockeyed one way or the other. Um, 
And if you've got it too tight, some people have tightened that down because it's been leaking a little bit. You don't want to tighten that down too much because it'll actually uh, push that, uh, that uh, gland wrapping in there down on the shaft and you'll get wear on your shaft. Um, is there anything you want to add about that, Robert? The, the picture on the right, mm -hmm. all, all the way to the back of the barrel there, that's a labyrinth, right? Uh, uh, back here, you've got your cat seal. Uh, what, what, you guys, do you remember Roberto at DLP when we let that go too long? And that the labyrinth, uh, what happened there? I mean, it was, it was, it was a pretty bad deal, though. And we didn't realize we were wearing that. We weren't. I mean, it, it takes a long time, but that. What happened back there, Robert? I mean, yeah. So let's see. I think we've got another slide in here, and here's a better shot of it. That's a really good question. So I think we've lost the animation on this one. Uh, uh, but can you walk through? So what? What Jim is referring to? So you've got a thrust pot, all right? So you've got a shaft coming, your main shaft coming out of your gearbox, coupling, coupled to the auger shaft. All right, so the bearings, the bearings on that auger shaft are in a thrust pot right behind the vacuum chamber. And there's two bearings. There's a radial bearing, and point to that one, George. Yeah, and then there's a thrust bearing. All right, so all of that's in that thrust pot on the back side. And that runs in, that runs in an oil bath, and that's where we were talking about running looper plate number eight in that thrust pot. Well, the way this works, and uh, let's see, is that a... Uh, that. All right, so actually the way this works is you've got a grease purge to where grease runs all the way in here and you wind up, and just like we were talking about at the rear of the pug sealer, we purge grease in to keep dirt out. And we call that a caterpillar seal. Actually, it was it's made by caterpillar, or that's where that was first first came up. It was, it was a seal that caterpillar used on some of their equipment. So as you grease that, you purge grease out, and it keeps grease, it keeps dirt, it keeps dirt from getting back into the pot. Well, there's two things. If you if you don't grease that, if you don't grease that enough, dirt starts to get back into that pot, and as that as that seal and that bit starts to wear, the other thing that happens is keep in mind on this side of that pot, that's the vacuum chamber. All right, so if it, what can eventually happen is if you lose that seal, you can actually suck the oil out of that thrust pot into the vacuum chamber. If you can't keep oil, if, it, if you can't keep oil in that thrust assembly, and you don't see it leaking out the back here, and so there's where the packing is back there, and so what you want to do is keep that packing up tight. If you see a leak or something's leaking, we're going to tighten that packing up. But if you can't figure out, it's like, I can't, I can't keep having to add oil, oil to that thrust pot right there, and I can't figure out where it's going. What's happened is you've lost that caterpillar seal, and it's sucking oil out into the vacuum chamber, and it's just going to be a matter of time before you lose those bearings. So that is a standalone uh, oil pot. Uh, it's not hooked up to the main loop. No, that's right. It's just that it's, there's no oil that's circulating through it. It's just running in an oil bath. Right. And uh, and you can change that cover plate and that caterpillar seal from the inside. And it's another one of those kind of funny things. You need to get a little guy, a guy my size, can't squirm down in there. But you can break it loose, and we can change those seals uh, uh, seals inside the machine. If you if you do it if you if you let it go too long you're going to lose that thrust assembly and and they're expensive everything in that is is expensive a lot of times the shafts we can get, we get them sent back to the shop and a lot of times the shafts are good and you can reuse the pots but the bearings have to be replaced the, the cover plate the caterpillar seal uh, it, it's it, it's good so this is if you're how about this? If you're if you're looking after that brick machine, you really need to pay attention to this part of the machine. Um, it, it's just really critical to how the machine works. But this is this is the this is the grease purge here through that caterpillar seal, and there's a cover plate that'll wear in time. But George, you could probably look at them and you can tell you can tell how bad they're worn. But that's the telltale sign. If you ever can't keep oil in there, that's what's happening. 
that, that cover plate that seals worn and sitting sucked out the back. Oh, I guess it's up to me. I need mean, where we're age change now. Okay, it's good too. Um, <clears throat> so, how many of you have your your sight glasses that you can see pretty well in the, in a plant? Uh, some some of them they get they end up getting painted over. That's not good. You want to replace that? <laughs> if I mean, this is something you can look at. As, <clears throat> when when the machine is sitting idle, with your your clutch disengaged. You won't see any oil flowing through there because your your pump is attached to the uh, pulley input shaft. So when you engage your clutch and you start turning that shaft and everything starts spinning, you should see oil through all your sight glasses. And that's something you want to make sure and you check because uh, all those lines go down to your to your main bearings on your gearbox. Um, some of them <coughs> I've seen they'll, they'll start leaking a little bit. Uh, you want to try to fix that because after a while you get a little oil film on the outside and the dust sticks to it, then you can't see it anymore. But you, you can tell uh, the people or the operators that pay attention to their to their sight glasses because they'll be clean. I mean, it doesn't take long for, for those things to get covered up with dust. Um, <clears throat> here it's showing the correct level of uh, oil in your sight glass. Um, <clears throat> what is this, uh, the, the tail stand? Yeah. Uh, on, yeah. Um, the bearing on, on your tail stand, it takes uh, grease as well. Uh, a lot of those are remote though, aren't they, Robert? Yeah, and, and how about this? This is, this is one of those good rules of thumb. We talked about good, good things. So George talked a little bit about automatic greasing systems. And so there is where we've got a, a system that we sell that you've got a tub of grease and a pump that cycles on every four hours or eight hours. And greases everything. I, how, here's mine. Here, I'm, a, I'm a bad salesman. I wouldn't have one. And and here's the reason. I'd a lot rather have a manual grease manifold sitting on the side of the machine and have somebody go over every four hours or every eight hours, every 40 hours, and go down those grease fittings. So you can run grease lines over one side of the machine. And 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 actually, the automatic greasing system is fine. But I'll give you two things. You better still make sure there's a tub of grease back there that hadn't run out. And the other thing is, if you ever have a power failure or a lightning strike, you know those panels can go off. You know, it can get knocked off, and it's out of sight, out of mind. I think if an operator, if you if you just got it in the habit, well, I'm going to drain the water off of my tank, uh, vacuum tank at the beginning of the day, and I'm going to grease midday and at the end of the day, or something along those lines. I, I think that's easier to make it happen, but I. The automatic greasing systems work, but there is a chance for something to go wrong with them, and and somebody's got to be paying attention to make sure they're doing their job as well. But, yeah, yeah. But that's got to. So what what we put on there is that looks like that. that uh, that's where you've got a flexible line running over a grease manifold, uh, either either off a, an automatic greasing system or a manual. Either one. That's right. Yeah. And then this up here, uh, <coughs> these are the, your grease points for your uh, Labrador seal on your pug mill. Um, and I think they get overlooked once in a while too, just because they're kind of up out of the way, and out, you know, out of sight too. Um, but if you don't, if you don't keep that uh, seal purged out, <coughs> uh, you'll get material that builds up coming the wrong way. Um, if you see the, they look kind of like little, like volcano ant hills underneath that spot on your machine. Uh, you know, you probably got something something going on. You need to. It could be that your labyrinth seal's uh, already gone, or maybe you could just need more grease to it. Um, they're not hard to change, but it's still a kind of a, a pain in the butt because you'll be down for several hours, you know, doing that job. Um, and if you let it go too long, <coughs> I believe you'll uh, end up eating it into your shaft. So uh, it's it's good to keep eyes on on that as well. Oh, here's some examples of uh, the sight glasses we were talking about earlier. These up on top are really great. Um, here's one that's got, looks like it's got a little oil leak, and then the dirt just sticks to it like a magnet. Uh, and you can tell that one hadn't been looked at probably in a long, long time. Uh, then over here, you know, somebody got happy with the paintbrush, 
and uh, painted over the the glass. Um, and some some are worse than that, but uh, looks like they may have tried to scrape some of that off at some point. But that's that's not doing them any any good either. Uh, <coughs> Oh, here it's talking about the, uh, the the pulley hub bearing, manually greasing it. Uh, we talked about that earlier. And then also what's shown in the picture over on the right is you've got a couple quick release valves on that clutch. And so that, let's see, so here's a picture of the quick release valves. So there's two. And uh, every now and then it, we've got a little rebuild kit for those, but it's actually good to take a an air hose. I, uh, I got to be careful saying that now with Pilica, <laughs> Pilica uh, rules and everything else. But uh, but what's nice is you can have a little dust and dirt build up on those clutch discs and everything. And uh, and typically what you can do is take an air hose and periodically blow those out. I know we wound up one day having a, a clutch after lunch smoking one day and you get pretty nervous in a hurry when that happens. We went up and blew it out real good and went on and, uh, and took care of it. So periodically blowing those out and making sure those clutch release valves work, work correctly and there's not a whole lot associated with, uh, with maintaining those. And as George said, you've got that, that pulley hub bearing that, that you, you, because it's rotating, whether you had an automatic reason system or anything, you got to get crawl up there and manually do that one, and it's once every 40 hours, so it's once a week for single shift operation. Um, <clears throat> have you guys checked out the website jcsteel.com? There's a lot of lot of neat information on there as well. Um, how many of you, do you do you order your parts online? Your wear parts. Uh, there's the steel services for you guys that, that aren't doing that or if you want to look but even if you don't order the parts um, maybe your uh, uh, plant manager has access to that but there's there's good drawings on there um, on the steel services website uh, if, if you're looking for something just kind of uh, that's not in the ordering charts uh, it might be on your uh, steel services charts where you can deselect your wear parts and actually look at different drawings on the machines so it's it's really useful uh, and we uh, and we also offer uh, if, if it was an opportunity for us to eliminate mistakes in the ordering process, so we actually offer a two percent discount for anything that's ordered online. So, uh, and uh, I know there are a lot of guys that might order something on Sunday night, you know, and uh, it, marking stuff off the list for Monday. That there were guys that, that would do that, but anyway, we we do have a lot of information. All of our sales flyers are on the website, but. Um, anyway, we can supply we can supply if it's order uh, if it's IOL and M's or grease charts uh, or any of the drawings we talked about today. You know, we'd be glad to supply those. So. All right. How about questions? Anybody got any problems on their machine that they're just dying to ask about? Now's the time. Problems, things you guys saw, want to talk about? You know what, uh, here's what I'll do for Jim, and uh, let me get it back to you, Jim. But uh, let me get a PDF of the presentation that we used this morning, and I'll, I'll get that sent back out to you, and then if you'd want to distribute that to the guys, would that be the best way to sure. do that? Absolutely. Okay. Glad to. All right. Good idea. And that'll, that way everybody will have a copy of the slides. And, uh, and I think what we can do is probably attach those three charts for a 75 and a 90 as well would be good for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. That's it. Thank All right. you, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, Robert. I'm sure lunch is all uncovered. We're just waiting for our... <laughs>